Some years ago, I was speaking to a candidate in the RCIA program who thought, like many already Catholics think, that all priests are in vows of poverty, chastity and obedience. And I explained to her that most priests are not in fact religious. And she responded, so you don't need to be particularly religious to be a priest. <laughs> well, what to say to that? The Dominican constitutions provide that novices are to be instructed about priesthood, while students are to prepare for their priestly ministry by integrating it with their religious life. Novices and students often debate which comes first, religious life or ministerial priesthood. Often this is in reaction to an older notion of religious priests as diocesan priests in a habit, or at least with a habit in the closet. Also in the background may have been a Thomist metaphysic, according to which episcopacy and religious life are not ontological states, were not inscribed upon one's soul the way sacramental characters are, could presumably be dispensed and would not carry forward into the afterlife. But priesthood, like baptism and confirmation, brought about an ontological change. Priests are priests forever. Also in the background was the idea that formation was a thing to be endured, patiently, for a few years only. However much regents, chapters and documents might pay lip service to ongoing formation. Clothing in the habit, simple profession and solemn profession were stages along the way to the great liberation, priestly ordination. Dominican priests, especially if appointed to a parish, as many of them were in my province, were largely free of their community and superiors except when it was convenient to plead the Dominican thing against the bishops and diocesan and clergy. And a symbol of all this that my own Australian province inherited from its, its Irish founders was the progression from white socks to black trousers under the habit and the raising of the habitual hemline to ensure that the presbyteral pantaloons were on display. <laughs> in the United States, I also met friars, rarely if ever seen in the habit, who sported the most elegant diocesan clerical attire. Presbytery trumped priory. In the post-conciliar Dominican order, as elsewhere in the church and culture, there was desire for a less authoritarian flatter, more egalitarian approach to live out what the Order's constitutions called being equal in profession and what the Council called the common priesthood of all the baptised. No longer afraid of Protestantism's emphasis on word over sacrament, the Council recovered the centrality of proclamation in the lives of priests and laity, a matter to which I'll return. Many felt this freed up Dominicans to be more truly themselves, preachers rather than sacrament factories. Some now dispense themselves from all the trappings of the clerical life. Ironically, as the number of cooperator brothers declined to near zero in many parts of the order, everyone started using the title and the few remaining brothers were press ganged into higher education or leadership. In my view, the demise of the brothers' vocation partly reflects the increasing middle classification of the order, church and society. In various post-conciliar acta of general and provincial chapters, in letters from masters of the order and in books on Dominican spirituality, priesthood rarely rated a mention. In the rivalry between presbytery and priory, Many proudly proclaimed that they were Dominican first 
and priests only incidentally. Well, as the pendulum swings again, we can expect that the next generation of Dominicans will re-emphasise the priestly and hierarchical aspects of our lives. Presbyteral pantaloons may yet make a comeback. Whether they thought of themselves as religious clerics or clerical religious, many have presumed that rivalry between these two aspects of Dominican priesthood is unavoidable and that you must, from time to time, perhaps for the whole of your life, pick your side. Yet this is a strange thing, historically speaking. From very early in the church, some priests were religious, as were some lay people. St. Jerem was a priest who went off to live as a hermit in a cave with a lion and a Bible. Monasteries ordained some of their own to serve their communities as priests, and few thought that this was opposed to the project of the monastery. St. Dominic served as a cathedral canon in Osma, exercising the priesthood in the life of a cathedral whilst living under religious rule. He went on to found a new order that he insisted was both religious and clerical. No one thought he was suffering from some sort of multiple personality disorder. Reflecting that ancient reality, the present day fundamental constitution of the order provides that the order's nature as a religious society derives from its mission and its fraternal communion. Since the ministry of the word and of the sacraments of faith is a priestly function, ours is a clerical order in whose mission the cooperator brothers too share in many ways, exercising the common priesthood in a manner specific to them. Again, in this ancient and modern view, priesthood and religious life are comfortably integrated in a friar. The new congregations of the Counter-Reformation saw a change, however, in the way religious who were priests lived out their, that reality. It was, due to circumstance and planning, a more individualistic undertaking where a man was equipped precisely to go out and work on his own for extended periods of time, all the time exercising his ministerial priesthood, while the religious life was to a certain extent pushed to the background. Saint Ignatius famously forbade his troops to pray the divine office in common. Their charism included spiritual self-sufficiency. In the centuries that followed, especially the 19th, this model of clerical religious life predominated. In my own province and its mission territory, many small houses were established with no likelihood of ever having a genuine conventual life, but from which many good priestly works would be done. In Lumen Gentium, the fathers of Vatican II distinguished between the common priesthood of the baptised and the ministerial priesthood, but only after insisting on the prior dignity of the baptismal vocation. Christians share in Christ's one priesthood in two interdependent ways. Religious life was placed at the end of that document with Mary. For well, no council can cover everything. And clearly Vatican II wanted to balance and complete the work of Vatican I by articulating a much fuller theology of the episcopacy and respond, respond to the spirit of the age by promoting the vocation of the laity in the world. With the focus on these two classes of the church's members, it was unsurprising that the clergy and religious were slotted in mostly in terms of how they relate to bishops and the laity. Paul McPartland argues that the council's preference for the word presbyter over priest reflected not only the recovery of the priestly aspect of the baptismal vocation, but also of a notion of priests not as cultic figures, but more as members of the bishop's council of elders. 
Few would deny that the conciliar documents on the priesthood and on religious life were thinner and less inspiring than the hinge documents of the council with their rich teaching on bishops and laity. This left the church ill-armed for the vocational apocalypse after the council. A related deficiency in those two documents was that Presbyterum Ordinus proceeds as if all priests were diocesan clergy and Perfecti Caritatis almost as if all religious were consecrated laity. When clerical religious sought to rediscover their charisms and reinvent their constitutions in response to such documents, it's unsurprising that this renewal often downplayed the sacerdotal aspect of their vocation. An order of bishops? Question mark. St Thomas and his followers thought episcopacy or religious life, especially Dominican religious life, not ontological states, but rather the two states of perfection. Thomas didn't say what happened if you were both Dominican and bishop, as was his mentor Albert. Do these two states add, subtract, multiply or divide each other's perfection? But he successfully evaded all attempts to episcopate him, and many and may well have been in agreement with Blessed Humbert of Romans' declaration on hearing of Albert's nomination. I would rather you were dead than a bishop. <laughs> Why ruin your reputation and that of the order by letting yourself be taken away from poverty and preaching? However troublesome you find the brethren, don't imagine things will be better once you have the secular clergy and powers to deal with. <laughs> better to lie in a coffin than sit in a bishop's chair. <laughs> Clearly, Humbert thought the Episcopal state of perfection would subtract from the religious with no remainder. It took quite a while for us to settle into our identity as Dominicans and for others to accept and appreciate it. By 1255, Paris was in uproar. The friars had been too successful not just in converting big crowds by their preaching, but also in poaching the laity and their collections from the parishes, poaching vocations from the diocese and poaching students and professors from the universities. They'd been too successful also in gaining various privileges, such as a general preaching mission granted by Honorius III in 1217 and the general mission to hear confessions extended in 1221. Trouble had been brewing for a long time. Some scoffed at the very notion of an order of preachers. After all, everyone knew that bishops were the only ordinary preachers in the church. Priests, when they preached, were to the word what extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion are today to the Eucharist. If the friars would be preachers within and without the liturgy, Dominic thought they would need the best of educations. They soon infiltrated the universities, helped them develop, but created new tensions with the local clergy who had been the intellectuals to date. The preaching and the studies meant a radically new form of religious life that included the old monastic practices but also provision for compressing or even dispensing from them. Penances, liturgical hours, charitable works, administration of the sacraments, presence in community, all could be waived for a just cause. To many, that seemed altogether too secular, as if religious were aping the diocesan clergy. Matthew of Paris wrote that the Cistercians were the real religious, they lived decent, orderly lives, pleasing to God and the church. They stayed in their cloisters, worked hard, prayed hard, and obeyed their superiors. The friars, on the other hand, wandered about the countryside, getting up to who knows what, their superiors not even knowing where they were. 
little has changed. <laughs> <laughs> to many, this seemed triply absurd. Priests who preach, religious who are learned, and monks who leave their monasteries. The friars were not backward in defending their new form of life. Stephen of Bourbon records that a Dominican novice was being taunted by some monks. He responded by asking them whether our Lord's was not the most perfect, most excellent pattern of life. When they said, of course it was, he retorted, but when I read that the Lord Jesus Christ was not a white monk nor a black monk, but a poor preacher, I know I've joined the right bunch. But such witty reposts rarely convert people. The monks, I guess, just thought that novice was a smart ass. <laughs> now William of St. Amour and his allies wanted all the friars' privileges and ministries removed, including their rights to preach, teach and absolve. He wrote furious pamphlets against the friars as the spawn of the Antichrist. At first, the popes defended the order, but the orders, because the Franciscans were also in the gun. But in November 1254, Innocent IV revoked the friars' privileges, took them out of the universities and subjected them to the local clergy. By the autumn of 1255, feeling against the friars was at fever pitch. St Jacques was virtually under siege. Mud and stones, garbage and insults were rained upon any friar who dared to venture outside. And the university would not give its star pupil, Tommy Aquinas, his master's degree. Well, nothing serves better to unite and energise the friars than a common enemy. St Thomas and the Black Friars joined St Bonaventure and the Greys in tag team wrestling with the secular clergy. The master of the order directed that litanies be recited day and night, and within two weeks the Pope was dead. <laughs> His successor, Alexander IV, as much influenced by fear of the friars' prayers as by arguments for their privileges, revoked Innocent's bulls, banished Saint Amour and his lieutenants, and as a final humiliation of the seculars, required the university not only to graduate the friars, but to give chairs to the underaged Aquinas and Bonaventure. Things took a while to settle down, but despite periodic hostilities, the friars were eventually regarded by most as a benefit, or at least no threat. Nowadays, similar suspicions and energies are directed in some places to the new ecclesial movements, who are, I'd suggest, at a similar stage of settling their identity, finding their place in the church's ordinary life, and being appreciated for the gifts they bring. Back then, we were seen as the neocats and opies, and met similar resentment. We just did not fit into the established patterns for priests and religious. All priests are preachers. One way the seculars had of getting their own back on the friars for stealing the best of their seminarians, priests and academics was to appoint them as bishops and thereby effectively draw them back into the diocesan ambit. When Albert the Great came to Rome to argue the case for the friars, he was provincial of Germany. When he left, he was bishop of Ratisbon. <laughs> A diocese, a diocese requiring a major clean-up. Three years were enough for him before he quit and returned to priory and laboratory. But this newfangled Dominican order of bishops had to learn one way or another to relate to the diocesan clergy and to integrate their own priesthood into their identity and life as friars. In the process, they helped change the church's understanding of priesthood so that preaching came to be seen as an ordinary part of priestly work. Few, however, embraced Blessed Humbert of Romans' somewhat extreme position that Christ was a friar preacher, 
rather than a praying monk or a sacrament dispensing diocesan priest. Along came the Reformation and some took fright of the Protestant concern for preaching. The Council of Trent, following Aquinas here as elsewhere, defined priesthood in terms of that which only priests could do, and so seemed to reduce priesthood to confecting the Eucharist and absolving the penitent. This suited well the Counter-Reformation determination to distinguish a Catholic sacerdotal priesthood from the Bible bashers across the road. Vatican II reasserted the centrality of the kerygmatic role for all priests, not just Dominicans. Thus, Presbyterorum Ordinus re describes Christ first as prophet and only subsequently as priest and king. Teaches that priests share in this threefold office in which preaching has a certain priority over sanctifying and leading and describes priests first as apostolic heralds and ministers of the word. To quote that document, the people of God is formed into one in the first place by the word of the living God, which is quite rightly sought from the mouth of priests. For since nobody can be saved who has not first believed, it is the first task of priests as co-workers of the bishops to preach the gospel of God to all men. In this way, they carry out the Lord's command, go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and thus set up and increase the people of God. Priests owe it to everybody to share with them the truth of the gospel. Charles Connor, in his recent meditations on the Catholic priesthood, traces this recovery of the preaching side of priesthood through the writings of Benedict XV, Hans Urs von Balthasar and Joseph Ratzinger, Paul VI and his successors. Paul VI Evangelii Nunciandi and John Paul II's repeated call to a new evangelization marked a new realization that formerly Christian but increasingly secularised countries were the new mission field for preaching priests. This newfound emphasis on the word, rebalancing rather than displacing Trent's emphasis on the sacramental role of the priest, should be very comfortable for Dominican priests. And we can expect more such encouragement from the apostolic exhortation soon to be published in response the 2008 Synod of Bishops on the Word of God. Where to then with the question of Dominican priesthood? If the documents of the Church are short on teaching on the mixed vocation of priest and religious, they are positively extravagant on that subject compared to the quantity of teaching on the mixed up vocation of bishop and religious. But there is enough common ground between these vocations to be able to map a life of both without having to sunder ourselves into two rival identities or suppress one for the sake of the other. And here I'd suggest six points of convergence. First, the clerical, religious and lay vocations are fundamentally Christological vocations. They are similar but different ways of participation in, imitation of, and identification with Jesus Christ. Baptism has a certain chronological, logical and ontological priority. It is the sine qua non of faith, membership of the church, all the other sacraments and professions, and the promise of eternal life. To the extent that our religious profession is simply a reflection and magnification of our baptismal equality, fraternity and apostolic calling, you might say that Dominicans are friars before they are priests. On the other hand, as Lumen Gentium makes clear, both the common and ministerial priesthoods are ordered to each other. The baptised exercise their royal priesthood above all 
by participating in that Eucharistic sacrifice, which can only be effected by a ministerial priest. To the extent that being a baptised Christian, being a professed Dominican, and being an ordained priest draw me closer to Christ and give me specifically Christic inspirations and arenas of activity, they will be integrated in him. Secondly, some commentators have, in my view, overdrawn the rivalry between the cultic and the prophetic aspects of priesthood or between cultic priesthood and prophetic religious life. We might ask whether Christ was most truly himself when he was out teaching or when he was breaking bread with his intimates, when he was proclaiming the kingdom of God or dying upon the altar of the cross. Despite Humbert's polemic and that of the novice reported by Stephen, it would be absurd to choose either, for both are essential to Christ as we know him. McPartland points out that everything that Christ did, all his teaching and service included, was done out of love for his Father and was taken up into the priestly offering of himself that was made to his Father on our behalf. For priests, religious and laity, all our evangelisation, catechesis, prayer, witness, penance, charity and pastoral guidance flow into and out of what happens at the altar. We offer it in the sacrifice of Christ himself and pray that the Lord will make it fruitful. It is in Christ that we find the integration of the various facets of our vocation. And it's in his Eucharistic body that we feed that unity and direction. So Dominican priesthood is Christological, it is also Eucharistic. Thirdly, the clergy live and serve in Medio Ecclesiae. The lay vocation, on the other hand, is principally lived out in the world. This is not to say the laity are excluded from the sanctuary or that the clergy are quarantined within it. All are, in Pope Benedict's word, co-responsible for the apostolic mission of the church to the world. Friars, you might say, are bridges between both worlds. When Dominicans are in church, it is to prepare them to take the church to the world. And when they are in the world, it is always with a view to bringing the world into the church. St Dominic's weeping over heresy and schism and zeal to bring people back to the church was born of his passion to bring God to men and men to God and the only sure meeting place he knew of was the church. Fourthly, if I might be permitted a little Dominican chauvinism, Vatican II might be said to have allowed the church to adopt a more Dominican paradigm of priesthood. By this I mean one in which the preaching role of priests is given its rightful prominence. I said enough about how that was lost and found in the wider church. But if that proclamation is to be truly apostolic, it too must be rooted in Christ, in his body that is the Eucharist, and so especially in liturgical preaching, and in his body that is the church, and so in the sacred teaching informed by the magisterium. For all our talk of a gratia predicationis, the fact is that Dominicans get their authority to preach and hear the confessions of those whom their preaching has converted from the church. And this was why Dominic, unlike Francis, chose to make his order a clerical one. Thus the fundamental constitution provides that having been made cooperators with the Episcopal order by priestly ordination, we have as our special function a prophetic task which is to proclaim everywhere by word and example the gospel of Jesus Christ. St Thomas taught that Christian priests are only trustees or stewards. They hold the faith and sacraments on trust, not for their own aggrandizement, 
but from and on behalf of Christ to be dispensed to the people of God. Priests are conduits, mediators, telephone wires. Alias tradere, we pass God and the things of God on to others. And if we're called to be conduits of the mysteries, we must be careful not to allow blockages in that pipe. Blockages like pride and self-glorification, possessiveness and exclusivism, using and abusing. If we are called to be conduits of the mysteries, we must not adulterate them for the sake of popularity or delight in hearing our own opinions. Too often when people juxtapose the prophetic or charismatic and the cultic or hierarchical, what they mean is that they want to do their own thing, free of interference from the tradition and its institutional guardians. I recently heard a provincial, and not a Dominican, declare that her institute's constitutions situated them at the heart of the church, but that these days the sisters didn't much like the way the heart was beating. So they decided to become prophetesses instead preaching from and to the margins. Her congregation is dying. Dominicans, even when they preach on the frontiers, speak from the heart of the church, where the gospel is, where the living tradition is. No ecclesial heart transplants for us. We are the church's preachers. Dominican priesthood, then, is Christological, Eucharistic, ecclesial, charismatic. Fifthly, it's learned. In his letter to the order of 1260, Humbert of Romans bragged shamelessly, we Dominican friars teach the people, we teach the prelates, we teach the wise and the unwise, religious and seculars, clerics and laymen, nobles and peasants, lowly and great. The Fourth Lateran Council rightly identified the catechetical poverty of the people, the educational deficiencies of their clergy, and the lack of apostolic zeal amongst the religious as principal causes for the dualist crisis of the 13th century. The Council's proposed solutions, however, such as requiring that a Master of Theology be appointed to each metropolitan church and cathedral school so as to educate the diocesan clergy, proved illusory. But God in his providence placed Dominic de Guzman at the council as peritus to the Bishop of Toulouse. And it was there that he conceived the goal and features of his priest friars. Only such creatures could answer the needs identified by the council. And study would be essential to this new form of life and mission. Some clergy talk of seminary studies as something they endured so as to get to what really matters, pastoral work. I've heard seminarians brag proudly that they'll never again open a book after their ordination day, let alone undertake a course of study. Hopefully they speak in jest or eventually discover that their mind needs feeding. But no true Dominican could say such a thing. Dominican priesthood is a scholarly priesthood, centred on the gospel and the received tradition of Catholic truth, contemplated in the company of other lifelong students and teachers, cultivated with the aid of faith and reason, and articulated with the best of rhetoric and piety. Dominican learning, rather than being worn on sleeves or being the subject of vainglory, should be at the heart of our distinctive way of being priests. Unlike the post-Lateran cathedrals, the Dominicans did manage to insist for a very long time on a doctor of theology in every convent. As well, they had such peculiar creatures as regents and studia generalia, high quality initial and ongoing academic formation, loads of scholars and sumai, and, as their only permitted vice, the accumulation of many books. Which brings me finally to sixth. 
Dominican priesthood is Christological, Eucharistic, ecclesial, charismatic and learned. It's also creative. Against the view that part contemplative, part active religious life was impossible, or at least inferior to a pure, unadulterated contemplative life, Thomas dared to propose that his order had the best of both worlds. This mixed life is sometimes a hard balance to strike. Individuals commonly favour one or other ingredient or oscillate between the two over a lifetime. Different balances have sometimes threatened to tear the order apart, as when the observants and conventuals each insisted that theirs was the only acceptable cocktail. But somehow we managed to stay united in the struggle to unite contemplare with Ali Estradere. By analogy, I've suggested this morning that we can be and often have been a uniquely successful cocktail of priesthood and religious life. A Dominican worships God in his cell with his beads as much as in the celebration of a high mass at the altar. He studies both at his desk chair and in his choir stall. He evangelises the Gentiles and then baptises the converts. He exhorts sinners and then absolves them. He preaches in the sacred liturgy and then offers the Eucharistic sacrifice. Being friar and priest are genuinely complementary in him. Yet when there is tension between these two names for him, or when it's unclear which should be the noun and which the adjective, the tension can be corrective, can be creative. When the friar in us is focused only on our own religious life and community, we might neglect the needs of the wider church. Were the priest in us centred only on the parish or the diocese, we might ignore those needing evangelisation. By giving ourselves in profession and ordination to serve Christ and his Eucharistic body and his ecclesial body, especially through preaching the Catholic faith, Dominican priests offer the church a special way of being priests and religious. It might be more demanding in some ways than being priest or religious simplicity, but the two can also support and enrich each other. I love being a priest. I love being a friar. In this year for priests, I give thanks to God and Holy Mother Church. I can be both.